G'day, and welcome to my review on The Dig. In my opinion, one of the more underrated LucasArts adventures. One that is either loved by players or hated. There's not a lot of middle ground between those two opinions on this game. And to be honest, both of the viewpoints have merit, and I'll try and present both the positive and the negative of this game, which there is plenty of both. What really sets this adventure apart from the other LucasArts endeavours is that this is a serious game. What they've been trying to do with this game is to simulate a movie style experience. When you think of LucasArts, you're normally thinking of games that are inherently funny, as in comedy is pretty much their main goal as an entertainment. While this game, alone in the LucasArts archives, is trying to entertain you through a serious experience of a story, similar to the way films also try to draw you into a story through realistic depictions of what you're seeing. While this deadly seriousness in The Dig is a huge plus for what it's trying to do, it also presents a few problems of its own that you don't get in the other inherently funny LucasArts titles. And that is, if you're stuck and you're having a hard time finding that item or working out that puzzle, the inherent comedy inside the other LucasArts titles will still keep you entertained. But the moody soundtrack and the quiet, lonely walking through the cavernous alien structures of this game does not have that same level of entertainment. For while that lends itself perfectly to the movie feel of this game, the actual momentum of puzzle solving and moving throughout the story needs to be maintained. And that is sometimes quite hard to do, for this game is very difficult in some places. In The Dig, you play Commander Boston Lowe, voiced by Robert Patrick, who is the leader of a series of astronauts who have been sent to stop a gigantic asteroid from crashing into Earth. Their plan is to go up there and lay some charges and settle the asteroid into a stable orbit to become a second moon. Yet, of course, they get up there and things go awry and they get whisked off into another part of the galaxy to this strange, seemingly abandoned planet full of ancient alien technology. And the goal is to get home and stay alive. This story is very much a writer's story, as in the majority of all the information about the plot and the really interesting things in this game are going to come directly from narrative. So you have to keep talking to everybody, keep opening conversation windows, or you're going to miss almost the entire point of this game. Because unlike many other games that use conversational trees to convey complex plots, you can actually finish this game without ever talking to anyone. It's almost like two separate games. There's the puzzle game and then there's an audiobook. So if you are trying to finish this game in a rush and are not taking the time to listen to all the conversation trees, you're really going to miss out on a truly interesting and deeply involving story. The game uses quite stunning art in my opinion to convey this story. The sets and backdrops are simply beautiful and very mysterious which lends itself to the entire feel of the game. You will be treated to a number of FMV sequences which are used as transitions between the various areas of the alien planet, as well as a number of hand-drawn cell animated cartoons which are used to advance the story's plot. These cartoons really do look great and are a very nice reward for advancing past a particularly difficult puzzle. The game itself is driven by the Scum scripting engine. Scum. Only a programmer could name a scripting engine called Scum. Anyway, you control Boston through a single button interface. The right mouse button opens your inventory or deselects the currently selected inventory item and gives you back your standard cursor. Every single thing else from walk to look to get to use is all done with the left mouse button. Now, this really drops the difficulty level of the game because you don't really need to have an understanding of what you're doing. You can basically just click on stuff and the game programming itself will decide what you're trying to do. And that can sometimes surprise you. While some people like this kind of thing, personally I think it detracts from the story. Without the ability for you to do these functions by yourself without the game taking over, you really lose a lot of opportunity for descriptive dialogues 
on the world around you, especially that the look command is actually an item inside your inventory and kind of hidden, which makes looking at things rather difficult and often you don't bother, which detracts from the feeling of exploration, which is so important in this game. The game has your standard item puzzles where you have to find items and use them in certain ways, though there is a number of very challenging and quite interesting puzzle box puzzles that I found to be pretty much the highlight of this entire game. One of the core concepts of this game is that you are exploring an alien world full of alien technology, and part of the puzzle box's puzzles is to actually work out how to use the machinery. I've heard a lot of complaints on forums of people saying, look, I can't work out how this machine works, how am I supposed to even do the puzzle if I can't even work out what the buttons do? But in truth, working out how the machine works is the puzzle or at least a great part of it. Now, while this is very difficult in some ways, it is actually not as hard as it seems. It's more of a trial and error game. You can work out almost everything in this game by trying something, and if it doesn't work, then trying something else. So while the puzzles do seem complicated, working out how to operate the puzzles, and thus being then able to solve the puzzle, is really just a matter of clicking around and paying attention to the kind of results that happen after you press the button. Unfortunately, there is a lot of repetition in these puzzles. Your basic movements through the game are as follows. Find a new location, work out what you're supposed to do there, find a clue to a puzzle which will then allow you to open a door, the door then opens a new section of the game. And it's basically repeated like this for the entire game. Work out the puzzle, open the door, work out the puzzle, open the door. And this can get to be a little bit repetitive after a while, especially once you've basically worked out how to do the puzzles because all the doors have the exact same puzzle. This game went through a long and extended development time. It actually first started development in 1989, but it wasn't released until 1995 and went through about three distinct incarnations before the final product that we see today. It was originally conceived by Steven Spielberg, which explains some of the movie-like elements of this game, and was in fact even going to be a film at one time, instead of a game. In the original version of the game, it is set in the far distant future, where a bunch of explorers are exploring a new planet, kind of like, say, an alien. The development was then taken over by a man named Brian Moriarty who decided to move the game into a much more horror type genre and this version of the game was probably the most adult and to me it sounded very interesting from what I've read about it online. Unfortunately Steven Spielberg didn't like this version of the game because he was more worried about whether the game would be accessible to families and children. Another quite interesting concept for this game, which was very ahead of its time, was to turn it into a type of survival game, similar to, say, the original Resident Evils, where you had to worry about food and water and survival was part of the major game mechanics rather than exploration and classic adventure game concepts. To my knowledge, there was no other games of this type at the time, and I believe it would have been a very interesting game to play if it had been done in that way. All these problems during the production over such a long period of time and all these different developers going in and being kicked off and then redesigning led the game to be considered cursed, as in the dig curse, which was originally coined when the developers all got together for their initial meetings and at the exact same time they all started the meeting, an earthquake hit San Francisco. Or so the legend says. All in all, The Dig is a terrific game and well worth your time. The story is engaging and the soundtrack amazing and if you really spend the time to lose yourself in the mood of this game, you're going to enjoy one of the greatest science fiction adventure games that is around. It does have its flaws and it does have its problems. But I believe that this game is very underrated for some reason, and I would strongly recommend you give it a go. Anyway, thanks for your time, and thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Come here, you phlegm, carapace, slime-faced, mucus-brained, furry-legged abductor of luminously intelligent but pulchritudinous earth women. What if I hadn't brought this shovel along? No. That's not worth thinking about.